you're not subscribed to this channel, please make sure to subscribe and set your notifications to all, so that you won't miss any new content. Welcome to another episode of Global Topic. I'm Jim Kunkel. Today's topic is going to be on offshore coding inspection, and joining me today is Stuart Fitchett from Core Spec Inspection. Stuart, welcome. Hi, Jim. Thanks very much for having me. Hey, Stuart, if you could go through and talk about what Core Spec does and then also cover your background for the viewers. Yeah, no problem. Hi, guys. My name is Stuart Fitchett, and I'm a coatings inspector from Edinburgh over in Scotland in the UK. Uh, and I'm a coating inspector who has worked his way from the tools into supervision and then finally into coating inspection. That's my background. So I've got a good uh, background and knowledge and experience which I found invaluable before I made the transition into becoming a coatings inspector. Um, Qualifications wise, I'm an ACE level three, um, I'm an ACE CIP instructor, and I also hold a level three paint inspector ticket from the Institute of Corrosion in the UK. Uh, my company, as you said, it's Core Spec Inspection Services. We're just a small company, Jim, but we tend to tender ourselves out and do some third party inspection sites, uh, verification services, etc., some documentation and stuff like that. Uh, more or less, uh, we we'll tend to be contracted to larger companies, being totally independent. That's what's the unique thing about Core Spec Inspection. And we just try to provide professional services wherever we are. You know, Stuart, for those who might not know what onshore and offshore means, you know, in, in relation to protective coatings, can you provide a, a basic overview? Yeah, sure, Jim. Um, you know, whenever we look at structures in an offshore environment, it tends to be like out at sea. So we've got to think how to get there in the first place. Everything, whether it's an offshore platform, whether it's the structure, the top sides, or indeed a wind energy project, they all begin life onshore in a fabrication yard, all much smaller pieces, of course. And these fabrication yards tend to be located, uh, located near the sea or to the coast. And the reason for that is because once the project is completed, the item or structure is then loaded onto a barge, which is then towed out by a heavy lift company, and then the structure is then placed into the sea at its final location permanently offshore. So that's uh, a basic of onshore, offshore. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible, but one way I could do it is give you a scenario uh, based on uh, my experience of a new construction project that was on a few years ago, and this roughly what's entailed. Uh, so, as we said, everything starts as a, a smaller piece, which is essentially all joined together to make a larger piece to the final item. How it gets there, Jim, is all these um, pieces of steel, whether they come by a uh, ship or by road, they all eventually land at site and they're inspected for damage because of transportation, sometimes for soluble salt levels if they've travelled by sea, and then sometimes the fabricators or the mechanical division, they'll have a look at them, make sure they're happy, and then they'll come to the blast and paint shed. Typically, Jim, you'll get a batch of um, what we call tubular steel or cans, and it's just like CHS, circular hole sections. That makes up the majority of a jacket. There's a top side. That's basically steel plate. Steel plate, I-beams, RSGs, channels, etc., all fabricate together to make parts of the deck sections. And what these do is these eventually come to the blast shed in a, in a big queue, if you like, and they go through the blast and paint facility. Once, they, once they've uh, been pre-washed, solvent cleaned, etc., checked for any, um, you know, laminations, slivers or weld spatter, etc. Once they've done that and there's no um, imperfections and fallen solvent cleaning, they'll just proceed into the blast chamber. What they then do is the guys will blast for a few hours, sometimes half a shift, depends on the, the size of the batch, but because it's basically a production line gym, they're trying to get as much in as they can. Following that, I know we'll talk about QAQC later, so... I'll keep it brief. What they do is blast them, clean them as long as they've passed the blast and the inspection. They then proceed into the paint shop. Where they're essentially all fully coated to the full system specification. That is, apart from if it's tubular steel, either end is left uncoated. And that's to facilitate welding of all the pieces together as it makes up the jacket. 
And the same goes for decks. The decks are obviously a lot bigger than the facility itself. So what they'll tend to do is they'll break these decks down into maybe three sections so it doesn't oversee the capacity of the glass shed. And likewise, Jim, on the, on the periphery or the edge of the decks, these are left uncoated too. But the central portion is coated to full specification. So when they join the pieces together, the heat created by the welding process is immense. So that would just burn the coatings. Again, once that's done, uh, they're all welded together, passed over to the paint department, and then the paint department ascend upon it and then blast it and paint it, essentially bringing it all back up to the same system. So it's all a full system across the board. That's a rough, that's a rough idea, Jim, of what happens. And this process continues until they have enough pieces we can start assembling in the shed. Once they start assembling, uh, you've essentially got a jacket that's fully painted, apart from the weld preps or the field wells, if you like. And once that's all done, the guys will come across and start ascending on that and try to get as many bits as they can. But at this stage, as it starts to grow, Jim, uh, there's a couple of things happen that everybody, all the different trades, want to put their self onto the platform, if it's the top sides, or onto the jacket. So sometimes it always done, sometimes it doesn't. And then eventually it probably reaches a size, whether that be the top side module or the jacket section, where it starts to exceed the capacity of the shed it's been worked in, which is great, you know, because you're beating all the environment. They're not chasing your tail. But when that happens, you go outside and you're in the mercy of the elements. And this process continues. You know, they'll have to have scaffold access, encapsulation, you know, keep it uh, as best as you can from the elements. And then each of these habita habitations, if you like, or encapsulations, is accessed by the painters as you go along. And that's roughly what happens, Jim. Now, this continues, and either one or two things will happen. Depends if there's project slippage, it'll all be finished on time, maybe with a little bit of delay, and sometimes it'll leave the yard unfinished, which isn't ideal. But uh, that's just roughly what happens on the job. We'll talk more about that when you go into QAQC, Jim. But uh, yeah, that's just a rough overview. Does that explain it all right for you? Oh, very much so. I very much appreciate it. You know, you know, Stuart, the ocean as an environmental zone, it's very harsh and severe on steel and, and concrete. You know, offshore structures that are used in energy production, you know, exactly how harsh can it be on a coating system, the ocean? Well, yeah, you know... Uh, when you compare it to onshore, Jim, uh, what you typically experience is, you know, you'll experience uh, cyclic dew conditions, you'll have rain, weather, wind, etc. Offshore is a totally different animal altogether. It's not only subjective, it's not only got to protect from the environment surrounding it, which is continually salt spray laden, uh, you know, it's continually getting hit with wave action and tidal zones. And then submerged as well, it's got to protect from obviously under the water all the way up to the top side itself. So yeah, you've got continual action of um, the salt, in, salt environment, you've got the wave action, you've got obviously uh, debris that can come and hit it, you've got action happens at the bottom of the jacket, for example, from mud and silt and, and gravel from erosion. So yeah, it's, it really is one of the roughest environments. In fact, it's classified as an extreme environment. And uh, unprotected steel, I think typically the loss don't quote me in these figures, Jim, but recently it's been up to about a one millimetre of thickness, maybe in excess of one millimetre thickness of metal loss um, in a year if it's left unprotected. So, yeah, it's, it's one of the roughest environments you'll ever put a protective coating or a steel structure into. You know, so, um, you know, typically what coating systems uh, perform best for offshore structure application? Wow, good question. Um, there, is, there are so many out there, Jim, and I can... What I'll do is I'll give you my input from what I've experienced. Um, you know, architects, um, specifiers, they tend to not steer from a tried and proven system. Um, some are brave and some do, and, you know, it has its, its, its results can be varied. What I have tend to uh, have experience of, Jim, is typical high-build epoxy. So if we take you from a jacket structure up to the top side, you've got different zones. You know, you've got your submerged zone, which is continuously submerged under the water. You've then got your atmospheric above that. And in between that, you've got the worst environment, which is the splash and tidal zone. So it's constantly getting that wave action and constantly being wetted and then dry and wetted and dry and getting salt deposits, giving it more chance to permeate through the coating. 
So typically on a submerged uh, jacket, you would have, I don't know, possibly four to 600 microns of uh, two coats, of course, of maybe a high build uh, modified epoxy and come up to the splash in atmospheric zone you'll extend this coat and seems to be the same it tends to be glass flake which is uh, epoxy and that's a much higher solid content sometimes about 93 percent because it's pigmented with the glass flakes probably about 33 percent of it is glass so what that does for people who don't know about that it creates a, a layering effect or a, a, a leafing effect of the glass because all coatings are um, semi-permeable membranes, especially if they're organic ones. And it just slows down that transition of the passage of water going to the steel. So that's what's really good about it. It's also good for abrasion resistance. Then moving to the top side, you know, the system's ranging, depending on temperature, of course, in an environment with structural steel, typically protected anything from high to 880 microns, all the way up to maybe three and 400 microns, depending on where it is. And uh, yeah, that's about uh, all the system. But yes, yeah, systems I've got generic, certainly off the generic systems, but specifiers and architects and engineers do tend to stick with what's proven because they're easy to repair these systems as well, Jim, because nothing goes perfect in construction or indeed offshore. So something that's easy to repair that the guys don't need a specific or specialist training on, that's the kind of coating systems that tend to be used. So, you know, when we look at inspection, many of the viewers of my uh, of my uh, channel, you know, we've we've covered a lot of aspects of inspection related to uh, pipeline uh, for the oil and gas industry, uh, uh, bridge coatings, and other type of structures and things like that. You know, this topic related to offshore, onshore, and offshore. Um, you know, I know we have a limited time really on this episode. Is there any aspect of you know offshore coating inspection uh, that you wanted to focus on here with the viewers? Um. Just to say that the, you know, we're led by our inspection and test plans, our uh, coating specification, and indeed the requirements and the instructions that are within the product technical data sheet. That is gold. That should be that is your bible, and that should be that is what we measure against. People say, "Oh, Stuart, you know, sometimes you've been a bit harsh there." I'm not. I'm being totally objective. I'm helpful, Jim. I like to help as much as I can. I'm a very down to earth and grounded inspector, and I like to help where I can. But the spec is the spec, and I have not got the authority to change that. And when it comes to meeting very close to the edge of that, you've got to use a bit of common sense. But ultimately, the spec is the spec. Now, when you apply that, that is what's governing the work that's being produced. And it's just more difficult to achieve that sort of standard offshore. Onshore, you've got the, you can go to these lovely blast sheds, and you've got the, the protection of them. Um, from the environment, you've got essentially heated, uh, environmentally controlled atmospheres. Offshore, it's a totally different animal. And yes, you'll get habitation, you'll get, um, you might get some heating, but it's, it's very hard to get these ideal conditions because you're continually um, surrounded by a salt-laden atmosphere and a, a hostile atmosphere in some cases too. It's not all bad, but yeah, that's. Uh, but the inspection principles remain the same. Um, whether it's onshore, offshore, it's just harder to achieve ideal conditions offshore, Jim, for uh, industrial protective coatings. Yeah, I, I do uh, do agree with that. I've had some experience um, more with the onshore, not much with the offshore, but I've I've heard stories, and I know you have uh, grown up through the ranks. Um, you know, you've been a blaster, an applicator, and now you're you know you're a, a inspector. Um, the other thing too is uh, I appreciate the instruction that you do as well because you know as the industries uh, grow and they rely more on inspect quality inspectors, they're going to need uh, uh, individuals like yourself that know a lot about you know what goes into the practical part of it and the applications and things like that, but also the theory and then the hands-on practical. So I, I commend you for that. Oh, thanks very much, Jim. It's, it's something that you know. I used to help a lot of people um, that I knew on site, um, you know, in the yards, and people will attest this who've ever cut their teeth in the yards. It's quite a, it's an alpha male environment, essentially. It's, um, there's a lot of girls come through and they're quite tough and they're strong and they hold the ground and I admire them for that and they're excellent at what they do. But it's a very tough environment and you've really got to know what you're doing. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, read your specification properly, get your equipment in order, get everything ready, 
have your have your 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 T's crossed and your I's dotted in terms of your your, your process because everybody's got a process when you go and do an inspection. Know what's coming, you know, because I'll tell you why. The yards are like Rottweilers sometimes, and these guys, especially strong old supervisors, they've been in the game for a lot of years, and they'll smell the blood, for want of a better word. If they think you're not confident or confident, you know, they'll tend to give you a hard time. It's not very nice. So I've helped a few people out, um, which has given me great pleasure helping them. Uh, I was very humbled by the fact they came to me, and that sort of led me down the track of saying, you know, I should try doing some instruction because I am passionate about the the industry. I think it is growing, it is getting better. Um, there's pros and cons to all of it, but I, I love the teaching aspect and uh, yeah, I, I love it. So long be at last. Yeah, that's great. It's a perfect reason to do that. Um, what I find a lot of times is uh, the pride of um, individuals who work in our industry and they want to give back and that is a, that's a noble thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I suppose one of the best things you can do, I think, during my instructor interview, um, you're asked sort of why you want to do it. And, and that is the thing that, that I got shown, you know, I, I was pesting the heels of an inspector when I was working in Denmark, so much so that he relented and he showed, and he, he, he showed me some of the skills of the trade before I become an inspector. So, you know, I appreciated his time. And also, I think, you know, what you just said there, Jim, it's really important that that you've got to be enthusiastic about it. You've got to enjoy your job. You know, enjoy what you do and do what you like. It's, it's important to them go hand in hand. And, uh, you know, videos like this are great. I think uh, you're putting the message out there because the coat inspection industry, it's, people think you get paid just to watch paint dry. I suppose you do in a way, but, you know, it's, it's great to, for, to give it more visibility uh, and for all us to come together and chat because it can be... It can be a little bit catty sometimes, you know, some person's got more experience and they're a little bit um, sarcastic about other people's experience or, or their opinions. We should all really come together and work together. And uh, videos like this, I'm hoping, will maybe, well, I know they are, they're having an effect on some of the people I've spoken to. They really enjoy your videos. I enjoy your videos, Jim, and I was really humbled to be asked. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. There, uh, I, I do believe that you and I are going to have more conversations because there's so much to unpack on not only this topic, but a lot of other topics related to coatings inspection. And uh, for the viewers, I'm going to have Seward's uh, contact information uh, in the video description, uh, a link to his LinkedIn profile as well. And I encourage people to, uh, you know, reach out to Stuart, uh, talk with Stuart. He's a, a wealth of uh, knowledge and uh, obviously passion in our industry. Stuart, I appreciate the opportunity to t today to talk with you. Oh, me too, Jim. It's, uh, it's been great. Thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Hey, have a great day, Stuart. You too, Jim. Thanks very much. Uh -huh.